air traffic control versus pilots. Cessna 36 Bravo, that would have been good information to know prior to your departure. Uh, you gonna ask? Coming up. Hey, 7-4 crew, welcome back. If you don't know me, my name's Kelsey. I'm a 747 pilot. My channel, 7-4 Gear, is all about aviation. Most people believe that one of the hardest parts about being a pilot is flying the plane. Actually, that's one of the easier parts about being a pilot. Dealing with air traffic control while you're taxiing, or passengers that are having problems in flight, things like that are really a lot more complicated to deal with. And here's some examples that don't go very well. Tower, Air Force 75, visual 311. Tower, 4785, Tower, there'll be a couple of departures prior to arrival, wind 33022, gust 31, runway 31 left, going to land. Uh, 3-1 left at Everett 85. Tower, 4785, uh, we gotta go around. Endeavor 4785, Roger Fly Runway, heading maintain 2000. We're heading 2000, Endeavor 4785. Endeavor 4785, turn left heading 250. 250, Endeavor 4785. And Endeavor 4785, when you have a chance, uh, can I have an, a reason for the go around? Yeah, of course, we got a guy thrown up in the bathroom. Ah, oh, alright, uh... Endeavor 4785 in contact, you approach 125.7, they'll bring you back around. 25.7 for Endeavor 4785, thanks. Something that's really good that the pilot did here when he was communicating with air traffic control is he read back just the part that was relevant when she gave him all that information. Listen to this. Endeavor 4785, Tower, there'll be a couple of departures prior to arrival, wind 33022, gust 31, runway 31 left, go to land. Uh, 31 left, Endeavor 4785. You see how the pilot just said cleared land? Granted, he was mumbling a little bit, but he said just cleared land. That's really the relevant part to all the things that air traffic control said. Sometimes I'll hear newer pilots, and I'm guilty of this too as well when I was newer, as they'll read back all the winds and, and the traffic and all the different things that she said. Those are just information pieces. Those aren't things that are instructions that you're required to read back. That part that's very important there is the cleared to land. So that helps shorten up the communication, and so the pilot did very well on that part. You heard me say in the past that when you hear a communication from air traffic control, if you read back exactly everything that they told you, if you read it all back in the way that they said it, usually you're going to be saying everything correctly. Obviously, there's exceptions to every rule, and this would be one of those exceptions. So they did do everything well here. Now, this airline, Endeavor, flies the CRJ, which is a plane that I used to fly. It's a regional jet. It's really a great plane to fly. And for all of you that aren't ever planning to become a pilot, there is something here that's very important that you can learn from this audio. Listen to this part here. And then number 4785, when you have a chance, uh, can I have an, a reason for the go-around? Yeah, of course, you got a guy thrown up in the bathroom. I don't know which version of the CRJ they were flying, but some of these CRJs have two jump seats, and one of the jump seats is in the back in front of the bathroom, which means that if the person was in the bathroom throwing up, the flight attendant couldn't be in their seat, which means the flight attendant's in an unsecure spot and the passenger's in an unsecure spot. So the pilots did the right thing about making a decision to do a go-around. It's better to do a go-around, come back and try again a little bit later when everybody's in their seat. But here's the thing that you can learn if you're never planning on being a pilot. If you're in one of those smaller jets and you're getting ready to land and you feel like you're going to throw up, take the six sack that is in the seat in the front of you, take that and throw up in there. Will it be embarrassing? Yes. Will people hear you? Also yes. Will people smell your throw up? Probably. So all of that is going to be terribly embarrassing but not as embarrassing as probably what happened in this scenario here. If that passenger had gotten up, that means in those little bathrooms, there's not a lot of space. I've been in them. You will not have space to throw up and get in that throw up position. You will not have space in these regional bathrooms, which means the door is probably partially opened up with your feet sticking out. So now your feet are sticking out, you're bent over and you're throwing up in an airplane bathroom, which is just, it's gross. So I want you also to remember that men have a hard time hitting a toilet bowl when we're standing there at a house. So you can imagine during turbulence just how bad our aim is. We don't become super snipers uh, once the turbulence hits. So just keep that in mind as you're crawling around the floor of a bathroom. Not a great idea. So option A, this passenger is in the back of the plane where their people would have to turn around and see them. That's not great. Option B is they're in a CRJ 900, which is one of the larger CRJs that they fly in the US. And that means that his feet or her feet are sticking out of the bathroom at the front of the plane, which means everybody can see. So now you're flying into New York. There's people that are probably going to be delayed for their flight. And they're going to all know that they're delayed because you are the person that was throwing up in the bathroom with your hands and knees probably on the floor of this super disgusting bathroom. So of the two, it'd be better to just sit in your seat. People in the 
probably two or three rows up front of you. Obviously the person beside you, everyone's gonna be grossed out, but that's probably better than the whole plane going around and now everybody's 10 or 15 or 20 minutes late because you're the guy. So don't be that person and then you have to walk back and everyone's looking at you feeling bad. If you're just throwing up in your corner, hopefully you have a window seat. You just throw up in your corner, pull your hat down over your head. And then here's the other thing that's really important to remember. All that throw up that's in your trash bag, that your little, your six sack, just take that off the plane with you. That's not a present, don't hand that to anybody. Just take that off the plane and then throw it in the garbage can somewhere. But don't hand it to the flight attendant and don't leave it on the seat like it's a present. I've seen people leave those on the seats like, uh, here you go, a little parting gift. Don't do that. Jump on ground, 8263 Bravo is ready to taxi. 8236 Bravo, Joplin Ground, runway 36, taxi via Bravo Delta Charlie. Uh, say again slower, please, sorry. Cessna 8236 Bravo, Joplin Ground, runway 36, taxi via Bravo Delta Charlie. 8263 Bravo, taxi 36. Uh... Cessna 36 Bravo, expect a progressive taxi. Proceed on to taxiway Bravo, ahead and to your left. Cessna 36 Bravo, taxi straight ahead. Okay, AT63 Bravo is taxi on Bravo. Cessna 36 Bravo, you just passed Bravo. Turn around, make a 180. Okay. So this pilot is about to do her solo flight. If you aren't familiar with that, somewhere around 20 hours at the very beginning of your training, you go do a flight by yourself. You do three takeoffs and landings. It's very nerve wracking for you. Up until this point, you've had your instructor there. So you're about 20 hours in, which means that your flying skills are really not that good. Your radio skills are also really not that good. You're just not good in general. But all you have to do is do three takeoffs and landings. And it's a huge boost after you do that. The confidence usually improves a lot because you're like, Whoa, I just did three takeoffs and landings by myself. So it's a huge milestone. I'd say it's one of the biggest milestones that you'll have in your aviation career is getting that underneath your belt. So I understand why this pilot is a little bit rattled here. If there was some guy who was making YouTube videos back when I did my solo, I maybe would have ended up in here because it was a total hot mess. The winds were, I think, like a crosswind at 10 knots. It felt like 40, but I think it was probably 10 or maybe even less than that. It was probably, winds were probably calm, but it, it was all, I was all over the place. So I understand the feeling of this. This is a chart of the airport she's at. Let me zoom in here because this is actually the section that, of the airport where she's at right now. She's trying to go here. And the only way to really get there is from Bravo, Delta, and Charlie. This is a very simple airport. And before I'm ever going to leave an airport, before I call air traffic control to actually leave, I have an idea of the runway that they're using because I've listened and got the weather at that airport. And so I know what runway they're probably gonna use, where I'm at, and most likely how I'm gonna get there. So to get here to this part of the runway, the only way to get there realistically is Bravo, Delta, and Charlie. So you need to have an orientation of where you're at before you call. If you aren't aware of this little tidbit of aviation, we name all of our taxiways using the military alphabet is the easiest way to call it. Uh, a means Alpha, B, Bravo, C, Charlie. It's a phonetic alphabet. So if you've heard that in the movies where they're screaming out those things, that's the same way that we use these taxiways. But this is a very basic airport. Airports can get extremely complicated. I know early on in my career, I, I told you about it in a video a long time ago, I landed into Houston. I was a brand new pilot flying corporate. We landed into Houston, which is a very complex airport, which don't use single letter taxiways like Alpha. They use double letters, hotel, hotel, hotel echo. It's very complicated and I was not prepared for it at all. Take a look at this chart here at Houston. You can see that the taxiways, there's a lot more of them and it's a much bigger airport and a lot of the taxiways have two letters on them. So if you're not prepared for what's gonna happen, it's overwhelming because they're gonna start rattling off things and you don't have an idea of, even a rough idea of where you're gonna be going or how you're gonna get there. So you're gonna be behind the ball. Another thing to not be an idiot like I was is I remember trying to write down the entire word and I don't know why I was trying to do that, but they would say taxi via Bravo, Delta, Charlie and I was writing out Bravo, Delta and Charlie. Why, why would I write it all down? Just B, D, C, just write out the letter. So if you know the alphabet, which obviously is something you should know once you start to do your solo, if you know your alphabet, you just need to write those down. Now here's an example of how I would write down this, what's being told to this pilot here. That's how I would write it down. So taxi to runway 36 via Bravo Delta Charlie. And if they were to say something like 
Taxi to 3-6, Bravo Delta, hold short of Charlie. This is how I'd write it. And once you go to the airlines, if you ever go that way, usually one pilot will be writing it down. And then if there is only one of the boxes that we're always typing stuff in, they'll have a keypad and that's exactly how they write it too. The B, the D, the slash mark is the hold short and then C for Charlie. So that's kind of the way I do it and I've seen a lot of pilots do that. That's just the way I do it. You just have to find what works for you. You can be your own system. It doesn't have to be this system. You can put whatever you want on there, but you need to come up with a system so you can write it down because one, in a very busy airport, there's gonna be a lot of things that are happening. The other pilot's gonna rely on you, or if you're by yourself, you only have you to rely on. So you'll be able to write down what they said. You read back what you wrote down. They say yes, or they don't say anything, lets you know you wrote down the right stuff. And then while you're taxing, you can keep looking at your chart, looking at your notes of what you're supposed to hold short of, and you don't ever get in trouble. That's the easiest way, write it down, unless you're super crazy smart. I'm not that smart, so I have to write everything down. Something important to realize is that aviation is a very humbling profession to be in. You're always learning new things. You're learning a new plane, you're learning a new airport, you're always learning new things. So it's very humbling. There's always gonna be people who are gonna be better than you. So it's something to just get humble now. Don't do the I know, don't have that attitude. Just realize it's gonna be a humbling experience. You're gonna feel stupid as you go through flight school. Really, all of flight school, I felt like an idiot. I thought maybe I was the worst pilot that had ever gone through that flight school. Just realize that it's all part of the game. You just have to keep studying and keep working hard. That's the way it works when you go through flight school. And then when you go to your airline, you're gonna feel humbled again because now you're doing and learning all the new procedures there. And as you go along, it gets easier, but it's always gonna be humbling. You're always gonna have someone there at the airlines that's gonna help you, that's gonna help you get out of trouble. And the thing is, is if you just use your crew, it's gonna save you a lot of headaches. That's just my tip. In this situation, this pilot, she's by herself. So her teammate really is a controller. When you're flying by yourself, your teammate, your crew member is the air traffic control that you're dealing with. If you get jammed up, that's who you go to for help. So in this case, the controller says, I'll give you a progressive. Cessna 36 Bravo, expect a progressive taxi. Proceed on to taxiway Bravo, heading to your left. A progressive means that this guy is gonna act as your GPS. He's going to tell you when to turn left, when to turn right to help you get to where you wanna go. So for some reason, you've landed at some airport that you weren't prepared to land at and you don't know where to go, you would tell the controller, hey, I'm totally unfamiliar with this airport. Well, what you would say is, unfamiliar with the airport, can I get a progressive to wherever it is that you're trying to go? So that, then the controller will maybe be a little bit annoyed by it, depending on what airport you're at, but they'll give you the instructions on how to get there. Turn left now, turn right here, and they'll get you where you need to go. And then, of course, once you get there, park, get gas, or whatever you're gonna do, review the plate, review the chart of where you're gonna be leaving from, so that way when you call up the controller again, you can know, roughly, how you're gonna be getting there so you can write it down, read it back, and they're gonna be like, okay. If you then call up and go, hey, uh, I'm not familiar, can I get a progressive to the taxiway for the takeoff? They're gonna be more irritated because it's just gonna show you're not prepared. The problem is at this stage, this pilot, she's so new that she doesn't know what she doesn't know. She's unprepared, she's flustered, and things like that. And part of the fault of this is actually not all on her, part of it's on the instructor. The instructor shouldn't have let her go out because she really has no idea as far as what's going on with her radio calls, her radio, her radio skills are very bad, and her preparation. So part of that is on her, but a lot of it is on her instructor because at this stage, she probably has, I don't know, 20-ish hours. So she's not prepared, but she doesn't know what she doesn't know. You see what I mean? 36 Bravo, are you a solo? Yes, sir. Cessna 36 Bravo, turn left on to Charlie, hold short runway 36. 86 Bravo is turning left on Charlie, um, holding 36. 36 Bravo, Roger, hold short runway 36. Holding short of what? Uh, 36. Cessna 8236 Bravo, contact tower 119.8 for departure. Okay. Call sign. Okay, I turn to 19.8. Delta Tower, do you read 8263 Bravo? Cessna 8236 Bravo, loud and clear, how me? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Cessna 8236 Bravo, disregard that. Uh, are you ready for departure? Yes, sir. This part where the controller corrects her about saying holding short runway 36 is actually correct and not nitpicky. Cessna 36 Bravo, turn left on to Charlie, hold short runway 36. 86 Bravo is turning left on Charlie, um, holding 36. 36 Bravo, Roger, hold short runway 36. Here's the thing. 
if the controller were to tell this pilot, hold short, and the pilot were to read it back the way she wrote it back, hold 3-6 or whatever it was that she said, if the pilot were to just read that back and then were to go onto the taxi or go onto the runway, the controller's in trouble. If the controller tells her, hold short runway 36, she says, hold short runway 36, and then goes onto the runway, well, then the pilot's by herself, right? She said she was going to hold short and then she didn't. So there's some really important phraseology and terminology that you have to use, and one of those things is hold short. That's something that we all get told, just like line up and wait, which is where you line up on the runway, but you don't take off. So if a controller says to you, line up and wait, runway 36, and you say, line up and wait, runway 36, and you line up in 36, and then you just take off, well, then you're in trouble because you said you were going to wait, but then you just took off. So those types of things, it's important that you read back what the controller says because then it protects them. So the controller might have sounded nitpicky because she wasn't saying it exactly right, but he was doing the right thing there. Cessna 8236 Bravo contact tower 119.8 for departure. Okay. Call sign. Here's another example of her lack of experience. And again, 20-ish hours in, I'm guessing the radio phraseology that she has is, is not good. So it's important to understand that what I would do, if I could do it all over again, if I had to do it all over again, and I don't want to do it all over again, but if I had to do it all over again, what I would do is when I'm at home cooking or at the gym or anything like that, I would listen to any of the apps that you can listen to air traffic control. I'd listen at the, at the airport that I'm at, and if there was like nothing going on there, I'd listen at a little bit of a bigger airport. And that's just gonna get you familiar with listening to the things that people are saying and the way that they're saying it. Now, I wouldn't jump, if you're brand new, I wouldn't jump and go listen to something like JFK or Chicago because it's just gonna be overwhelming. Things are happening so fast there. So I would just stay at your airport, listen to what's going on, or an airport that you fly to, listen to what's going on. It'll get you a little bit familiar with the taxiways that people are using, uh, some of the things that the controllers are saying, so it will make you even more prepared. So while you're cooking, while you're in the gym, while you're doing something that's not dangerous, like driving or something weird, go and listen to air traffic control and practice and look at the chart and see what's being said, and then you'll get oriented to what's going on. That's a great way to prepare. The more you practice anything, the more things will slow down. Every plane that I've ever flown, the first little bit, it's, it's overwhelming. There's a lot that's going on. Then over time, things slow down more and more and more. You get more comfortable. Your brain isn't working as hard. The same applies with air traffic control and talking with them. The more that you listen, the more that you study the charts, the more that you do all that stuff, the more it's gonna slow down for you, the less mistakes that you're gonna make, the better of a pilot you're gonna sound like on the radio, and the better of a pilot you're gonna be as far as how prepared you are and while you're taxiing and moving around on the airport. So it's just a matter of doing all that preparation is gonna make everything you look better, you sound better, all that stuff is gonna be a lot better. Now, up until now, I've had some criticism for this, this student pilot. Even though she's new, she has some responsibility. It's not just all an instructor. She has some responsibility. And the instructor has some responsibility. She, she was not prepared as far as her radio skills. I don't know about her flying ability, but her radio skills and, and her orientation and preparation wasn't there. So there's some criticism for her. But then now I got some criticism on this next part for what the controller does. Listen to this. Cessna 8236 Bravo Joplin Tower, runway 36 cleared for takeoff. 8263 Bravo, cleared for takeoff. Cessna 36 Bravo, frequency change approved. Frequency change, 8263 Bravo. Joplin Tower, 8263 Bravo is on left downwind. Downwind, am I cleared to land? Cessna 8236 Bravo, not in sight, runway 36, clear to land. 8263 Bravo, uh, cleared to land. Cessna 36 Bravo, you experiencing an emergency? Uh, no. 36 Bravo, understand you're wanting to stay in the pattern? Um, I need to do uh, three takeoffs and three landings for my student, or my private pilot. Cessna 36 Bravo, that would have been good information to know prior to your departure. Uh, you didn't ask? Cessna 36 Bravo, turn left Delta 2. Well, she's right, he didn't ask. So this, there's some missing audio here, so I'm not sure, and I may put my foot in my mouth of what I'm about to say, 
but there, there is some missing audio, so I don't know. I'm sure once I say these things, uh, the missing audio will get sent to me and, and I will sound stupid, but let's dive into this. For the controller, you know that she's on a solo. You know how it works. You know they have to do three takeoffs and landings. You know the game, right? So yet you're being a little bit snarky. Granted, she's underprepared. I don't know how her flying looks, but she's underprepared with her radio phraseology, her orientation and preparation, all that stuff she's way behind with. Unless she's doing something that's out of control as far as for her flying, doing something that looks unsafe, I would just let her do her three takeoffs and landings. Once she lands and then she's taxing back in, I would tell her, hey, you did nothing wrong, but I need you and your instructor to give me a call. You're not in trouble about anything, but just go ahead and give me a call and here's a number. Once she was parked and, and to have her write it down or tell her to stop and write the number down because she clearly isn't going to be able to taxi and write the number down and not get in trouble with where she's taxing. So I would give her that number and then have her give you a call. And now look, I realize that as a controller, you don't have the responsibility to do that. It's not on you. It's outside of what you are required to do. But this is just the way I see it. You are part of a team. Her and you are working together. And in the future, she needs to feel comfortable that she can call you if there's a problem, right? So if you were to get them on the phone and have a phone call with them, it would be two minutes and say, hey, listen, instructor, you need to listen to this radio phraseology and what she's got going on here because she's not prepared. And then I would tell her, you need to be a little bit more prepared when you come out here. So you have a little bit more orientation of what's going on and improve your radio skills. I would tell her that. Now that's a two minutes of your time. Again, you're not required to do it, but that would be my suggestion to you. Instead of being snarky to her on the radio here, you know what needs to happen. Even though she's messing a lot of it up, you can throw her a bone. There's been times where I've heard of pilots on final where they're supposed to call in at the final approach fix before they land. They're supposed to call in and they don't because they get jammed up with a bunch of different things. And then I've heard without the pilots asking for clearance to land, air traffic control realizes that they forgot to switch over at that final approach fix for whatever reason. And I've heard air traffic control transmit to that crew, hey, Boeing 123, you're clear to land runway 36 because they know that the pilots messed up and forgot to call, but they're gonna record that landing clearance on the tapes. So they're helping them out. They're throwing them a bone. So that's just something you could do and have a broader scope of responsibility and help this pilot out because obviously she's new and she's a little, little bit behind, but you could help her out. A two minute phone call, it would change everything. And she'd probably take a lot more time to get more prepared than being snarky on the radio. That's just my thought. And as has been our tradition on air traffic control versus pilots, time for the fun one. At Dallas 203, headed this next guy is the one that does the terrible uh, the Texas accent. You can call him on 324. See ya. Yeah. We'll, we'll see if he does it. It's, it's pretty. It's pretty bad. Uh, I'm afraid. Okay, 32. Four. I'll talk to you later. Okay. Delta 203, five thousand. Delta 203, heavy near approach. Good afternoon. <laughs> How you doing? Delta 203, heavy. Maintain four thousand. Maintain four thousand. Delta 203. You from Dallas? Okay, I'm not sure why I get so many clips from air traffic control sent from the New York sector. I get so many from there, but this is obviously a terrible Texas accent. This is called a transatlantic accent. Uh, Catherine Hepburn in the 30s, I want to say, is famous for having this accent. Listen to her talk here. You're not one for tears, and well, neither am I, so it's best to come out with it. I've met someone, I've fallen in love, and I'm moving out. I don't know why somebody would think that that's how the people in Texas talk. I don't know. I live in Texas, been living in Texas for a long time, never heard anybody talk like that. But sure, okay, whatever. I would do a terrible New York accent, but luckily I'm not an actor. If you want to see someone who is a good actor, check out this Leonardo DiCaprio in the Hollywood vs. Reality that I did with him. And if you want to see someone who gets lost in JFK, who also would do a terrible New York accent, watch this video up here. I look forward to hearing from you. Until then, keep the blue side up.